Open your Bible, if you will, to the book of Mark chapter 8. If it's possible to get the lights in the... Uh, I can't see the people very well. If not, that's okay. I think they'll smile at me. <laughs> Second book in the New Testament, the Gospel according to Mark chapter 8. And today, we're going to look at a miracle among all the miracles. It, it is in my estimation, the most unique miracle. It, you could say that it was on the installment plan. It, um, it, it's a twofold miracle. It took two touches for the Lord, for this guy to be healed. And it wasn't because the Lord couldn't do it with one touch, because on one occasion, he touched a man who was blind, and he saw immediately I begin in your notes with one introductory statement, and that is, this is the only time, this was the only time Jesus ever performed a miracle like this. So in all the Bible, in all the New Testament, this is the only time Jesus performed a miracle like this. And are you listening? You have to ask the question, why did he do the miracle this way. And before we're done today, I'll share with you why I think the Lord did it that way. Mark chapter 8, let's begin reading in verse number 22. Then Jesus came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. So he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town and when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. And he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. Then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up. And he was restored and saw everyone clearly. Then he sent him away to his house, saying, Neither go into the town, nor tell anyone in the town. Now, Jesus had been in this area before, and he had made a statement concerning, in response, should I say, to his teaching to this town. He said, If Sodom and Gomorrah had seen what you've seen, they would have repented long ago in dust and ashes, and the Lord basically wiped his hands, and he never again ministered in the town, Bethsaida, or Capernaum. It, 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 may, uh, it may explain why he led the man out of town. Jesus had had it with that town. They had seen miracle after miracle, and they put a deaf ear to Jesus. Well, Here's a story of a blind man, a man who was as blind as could be. And while Jesus touched another and the man saw instantaneously, this one was different because when Jesus touched the man's eyes, he only saw partially. And there's no miracle, no other miracle like this one. And now listen carefully. It's that span of time between the first touch that the Lord made on that man, and the second touch that way, way, way too many people are caught right there. And today I want to center my attention on that. I put in your notes in that box, there are a great many Christians that are going to heaven, but there's not any heaven in their lives. They're caught between where they are and where they could be where they are and what they ought to be, what they are and what they ought to be. Here's a man, folks, who said, I see, when the Lord asked him, but I see men like trees walking. I see enough to know that there's more to see. I see, but I don't see clearly. I put in your notes, be honest. And this is a very personal question. Would you, in transparent honesty, say that's where I live? 
Most of us, I think, would say that's where I get every once in a while. But this very morning, as you sit here and listen to me, or you're watching live stream, in transparent honesty, would you say, Ken, that's where I live. I've been saved. I, the, I've been saved by the grace of God. I'm on my way to heaven. I know that, but there's not much heaven in my life. I'm not what I ought to be, but I'm so far from what I should be. There are four areas that we're going to look at this morning. The first one is this. Number one, what does this condition suggest? What does this condition suggest? What's the characteristics of this condition? The good news is, folks, is this. You don't have to live this way. I don't care if... I don't care if all of your friends live that way. You don't have to live that way. You don't have to live commuting between Egypt and Canaan, between bondage and freedom, between really basically living to the lifestyle of this world or crossing over into the promised land, that abundant Christian living. You don't have to live and commute between glory and gloom. A great percentage of believers, in my estimation, see, I, I mean, they see better than when they were blind, but not like they ought to. You see, it's possible to know Christ. It's possible to know Jesus as your Savior and to start growing, but then to stop and to go to heaven a cripple. You know, one thing that is crystal clear in Scripture and that is the type of life that Jesus wants you to live and wants me to live, is what he calls abundant life. That's what Jesus says. That's how he wants you to live and me to live. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. But let's admit it, folks. Much of what we call today Christian living, you've got to stretch your imagination a long way to see abundant life. There's not, a mu there's not much abundant life thinking today. Not much abundant life acting. Not much abundant life giving. You see, the great part of the body of Christ, I believe, is right here where that man is. Here's a man. He was blind as blind could be. And, and a group of men brought him to Jesus and they begged Jesus to touch him. And Jesus said, okay. And he touched his eyes and he asked the guy, do you see? He said, yeah, yes, Lord, I see. Uh, I see men like trees walking. And the Bible says that Jesus touched him again and he saw everyone clearly. You know what that says? That says two things. Number one, it is possible to be in this state and get beyond this state. It's possible to be in this state. That may be where you are this morning. And be honest with yourself. If that's where you are, then I want, I want to tell you something about it. It's possible to be like that right now and to get beyond that in your life. Listen, and I put in, the, in, in that box in your notes this. If we're not taught as soon as we're saved that to follow Jesus is not a part-time proposition, that it's not a choice between the regular and the reserves, then we will have a problem. We will apply what we've learned in the world to the Christian walk. And determine that we can commute between our way of living Monday th through Saturday to his way of living on Sunday. I have to be honest. It's what I've seen in my life. I, it's, it, it's obvious that we quit expecting a long time ago the body of Christ to be the body of Christ. And is there any wonder why the message to this world is so diluted? A great percentage of believers 
They, they see better than when they were blind, but not like they ought to. As I said just a moment ago, it's possible to know Jesus as your Savior and to start growing, but to stop. Keep coming to church, keep going through the Christian stuff, and to go to heaven a crippled. The second characteristic is this. It's unfinished. In verse 24, the guy answered Jesus after Jesus touched him and said, I see men like trees walking. You see, if that's where you are today, that's not where God wants you to be. That, that may be what you admit and thank you for admitting it and being honest, but you don't want to walk out of here the same way that you walked in. Jesus doesn't want you to walk that way. I put in your notes, there's no better way to determine where a person is spiritually than to find out how they look at people. Jesus touched him and said, can you see? He said, yes, Lord, I see. I see men like trees walking. It's unfinished. How do we look at people as competition? A necessary evil? I, at the last moment, changed my notes in order to put this in the message notes so that you would hopefully read it after you get home a dozen times. I put in the box this question. How do you look at people as you walk down the street? Men as trees? No more concern for their soul than a tree. I'm not trying to be cruel or cute, but really, is that how we look when we see people in the office? We go to the mall, we go out to lunch, you pass people, how do you look at them? Just somebody you don't know? No more concern for their soul than a tree? That's where a lot of us are, I think. I see, I see, I see men, Lord, but I, I don't see them the way I should. Maybe I did at one time, but I don't now. Maybe I never have, Lord. I don't see them as potential believers. I see them as tools, something to use, someone to pass, a necessary evil. Heavenly sandpaper. I see them as well. I, Lord, I, I could do as well without them. Folks, listen to me carefully. People all around us are lost and without Christ. And in God's economy, there is nothing more important in our lives than to live our lives in such a way and to use our mouth in such a way and our life in such a way is to see people come to Christ. I put in your notes, how you see people reveals your maturity. There are people walking around thinking they're spiritually mature. You know why? Look here. It's because they have read through the Bible, they've studied books, they know the answers, they do this, they do that, but they see people like trees. No more concern for their soul. More interested in going to another Bible study than to invite someone to church. More interested in acting like a Christian than to seeing a person who doesn't know Jesus come to know Jesus as their Savior. You see, folks, as long... As we're full, we cannot sense the pains of this world's hunger. As long as we continually hear the gospel, you can't imagine that there are thousands upon thousands all around us that have never heard how to get to heaven. As long as we sit in our comfortable pews and spacious buildings, it's hard to imagine that there are people that have never heard a song of praise anywhere, all over this globe. 
How do you look at people? I want to open my life right now and tell you where I was. I've never known a day. I, I'm very grateful for the things that I've struggled with. I've, I've never hated anyone. Don't hold a grudge. I struggle with other things, but I'm grateful for that that I don't and never have. However, I got saved and throughout my life, I, uh, it's not that I tolerated people, I just, uh, you know, yeah, I, I like them, yeah, and that's fine. But all of a sudden, I get saved and I come to a place in my life where God convicted me that I'm not looking at people the way that I should. And I asked myself, do I love people? And the answer that I gave was no. I don't dislike them. I'm not mean to anybody. I help people. But do I love them? No. And I started to pray. Folks, this was about 10 years in the ministry. And I, start, I had led people to Christ. I, I was uh, faithful in studying God's word. But I was not where I should be because I didn't see people the way that he wanted me to see people. And I started to pray, and Lord, I don't see eye to eye with you on this one. And I figured that if there's any changing to do, it's me and not you, because you don't need to repent over anything. And so, Lord, I want to get thrilled over what you get thrilled about. I want to be pleased over what pleases you. I want to get burdened over what burdens you. I want to grieve over what you grieve over. I want to have a broken heart over what breaks your heart. Bring me, Lord, to your way of thinking. Quicken my mind. Cause me to see. And you know what, folks? He did just that. I don't know how to explain it other than he... he he, I mean, he just, he touched my life, and I've never been quite the same since that time. Slipped every once in a while, but oh my goodness. Here's a man who said, I see, Lord, but I know that there's more to seen. I've tasted God's grace, but there's more. Let me repeat, nobody, say the word nobody. Nobody, nobody ought to have to live this way. You say, well, can I know I'm not lost? I mean, too much has happened in my life. But I'm too much like the world. I know I'm saved, but I'm too much like the world. I'm commuting in my life basically from Monday to Saturday. I'm not a bad person. But I'm caught between that first touch and that second touch. I go week after week after week and I'm not burdened over anybody's lost soul. <laughs> I don't stay up at night thinking about people that I know that aren't on their way to heaven. It's been so long that I ever even invited someone to come to church that I don't even remember the last time if I ever did. Listen, you know what God wants to do? God wants this morning to move in your life so that his life is put on exhibit. Let me show what I mean. The Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 1 said, According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always. Now watch this. So now also Christ shall be magnified. Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Folks, you and I, Christ in us, the only Christ that someone may see before they see him at the great white throne judgment is the Christ they see in you and me. This man who was formerly blind, had to make 
one candid confession. This ain't it. I see, Lord, but I see men like trees walking. I, I, I see, Lord. I know you as my Savior, but there's not much of you that's living through me. Second thing, what's the cure for this condition? What's the cure for this condition? Two things, folks, only two things. First thing, number one, God's touch. A touch from the Lord. In verse number 23, the Bible says, and when he had put his hands on him, Jesus touched him. And in verse 25, then he put his hands on his eyes again. He touched him again. I love that song written years ago, he touched me, shackled by a heavy burden, neath the load of guilt and pain. Then the hand of Jesus touched me, and now I am no longer the same. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. You say, what do you mean he touched you? I, I can't quite tell you what it is, except you know when it happens. You know when God works in your life, you know when all of a sudden you've come to a place of candid confession to God, Lord, I, I, I'm not what I ought to be, but I want to be, Lord. God's touch. But there's a second thing, and that is your desperation. Do you notice in verse number 22? Before we go there, look here just for a moment. Can you imagine this man had been blind? Probably not all of his life, but maybe something happened when he was a kid. You say, what do you mean that? Well, because he said, I see men but like trees walking. So he, he, he knew what a tree was, but maybe he was blind from all of his life from, from, from birth. Can you imagine how it was? And these men cared for him. And they saw and he wanted to see like his friends. And the Bible says in verse number 22, then he came to Bethsaida and they brought a blind man to him. And notice what this, the men that brought him begged him to touch him. They saw the burden of this man that was blind. They heard him. It was his fr their, their friend. And these men went on his behalf, took him, and they begged Jesus to touch him. Here's the fact, and I put it in your notes. As long as you can live without it, let me stop there. Because I'm about to tell you the truth on why you may be still where you are. As long as you can live without it, three words. Put them in your notes. As long as you can live without it, you're going to. I have to tell you, over 35 years ago, when my, when my Christian life radically changed, when for the first time I had a love for people, and it wasn't just that I didn't want anybody to go to hell because they would spend eternity in torment. But I began to see people the way that Jesus... You know, what, you know how I got there? It's because I got desperate. I no longer wanted to live the way I lived. I knew that there was something more. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know the terminology. Let me tell you something about terminology. God isn't tight on words. He, you know, imagine calling on God and saying, God, if this is all there is, I, I, Lord, I'd rather die. And the Lord said, well, I can't help you. You don't know what to call it. Can you imagine? Um, I just want to thank God this morning. Praise God. He helped me before I knew what to call it. Get it, man. Just get it. You say, get what, Ken? I'm talking about that time in your life when God touches your life. You ask him, God, I don't want to live the way I'm living anymore. I'm mediocre at best. I'm commuting. 
Monday through Saturday, living like I want to live, and Sunday the way maybe you want me to live. I'm talking about that time when God touches you and you see and you know you see. And you see differently and you see clearly. It may not have been the day you got saved. But when it happens, folks, it changes your lifestyle. And it filters down to what you watch, where you go, how you treat people, how you walk, how you spend your money, how you give your money. God touches your life and you are never the same. You say, I see, Lord. You're doing something in my life that needed to be done. You know, as I study the lives, and I did during this period that I'm talking about, and I've done it throughout my ministry, to study the lives of great men and women, there was something in their life, something in the life of a, a Dwight L. Moody, A.W. Tozer, Charles Finney, R.A. Torrey, 10, 15 years after they got saved, that God did something in their life that, I mean, where he began to move, they began to move in a realm of divine power and activity. I've got a passion that you're not going to come to the end of your life and look back just before dying and look back over your life and go, I could have been so different. I could have been so different. You say, well, Ken, what's it going to take? Number three, what's it going to take? I'll give you the key. Here's what it's going to take. It will never come until you get honest about where you are. You see, if you know as much as you think you ought, then you are as smart as you're ever going to get. If you have as much power in your life, in your Christian life, as, as you think you need, you've got as much as you're ever going to get. Today, could it be that the Lord wants you to say, Lord, I can see but I can't see well. Something needs to happen to me. You know, for me, I think what God used more than anything else, two things, he used his word and he used Debbie's life, my wife, because she looked at people differently than I did. She prayed for people all the time. She was unashamed in the corporate world to share that she loved Jesus. In fact, I think it was her last job in Atlanta before she became pregnant with Brooke. Uh, she uh, was the uh, executive uh, to uh, the vice president of Johnson Higgins, a huge brokerage. They do Coke and Delta and all this. She had a great job. And her boss told her after she had worked there for a while, she had, he said, you know, I almost didn't hire you. And you, you know, Debbie, she said, really? He said, yeah. He said, I, this Christian stuff, because she was unashamed even in the interview when asked what the most important thing in her life was. She was unashamed to tell him that her relationship with the Lord, and that she knew Jesus as her personal Savior. Lord, I can see, but I can't see well. Something needs to happen to me. Is that where you are today, right now? You're not a bad person. But you need to see so much more. 
And that leads me to the final thing, number four. What's going to happen when you see? I want to tell you the results, folks. The results is this. A changed outlook on life. You're going to look at people when you go to lunch and you're going to look at people in your office and you're going to look at people when your kids play in sports and you're on the sideline with other people. You're going to look at people like you've never looked at them before. You know why? Because you're going to see people that Jesus died for. You're going to start asking yourself a question. I wonder if they're on their way to heaven or on their way to hell. You're going to be looking at people And you're going to be concerned over where they're going to spend their eternity. You're going to look at people that hurt you and you're going to look at them in a different way. You're going to look at money and you're you're going to see it not as the way you maybe perceived it to make you comfortable or to lift you above your neighbors. But rather, you're going to see your finances as something to glorify God. You're going to look at your problems and you're going to see that the problems now are... They're going to strengthen you in your walk with God. You're going to look at church with a new perspective, and you're going to look at yourself in a new way. And so today, is it time to say, Lord, I want to be totally honest with you. I can see, but I'm temporarily blinded. I want to see As you see, Lord, touch me. And he touched him again. And he saw every man clearly. I have not doubted from the moment I got saved. I've not doubted that I'm on my way to heaven. But a decade after being in God's family studying my Bible, being a good guy, leading people to Christ, I had to make one candid confession. I didn't see people the way that Jesus saw them. Every day they passed me by. I can see it in their eyes. People need the Lord. If that's where you are today, before you walk out of this worship center, before you close and turn off the live stream, listen carefully. Right where you are, would you just honestly tell God, Lord, I'm not what I ought to be, but I want to be. And today, would you touch me again? Would you touch my life? Lord, I remember the day I got saved. And I'm not what I used to be, but oh God, I'm not what I ought to be. Today, Lord, would you touch me again? And the Bible says, and Jesus touched him again, and he saw everyone clearly. But there's only one thing worse than being in that state. There's only one thing worse than coming to the end of your life, looking back and saying, I could have been so different. And that is coming to the end of your life and dying and going to hell. And you don't go to hell because, listen, because you live a certain way. Nobody goes to hell because they commit adultery or they steal or they do this or they do that. Nobody goes to hell because of that. People are going to wind up in hell because they're born a sinner by nature and they live their entire life, come to the end of it, 
draw their last breath and never accept what God's done on their behalf. And so listen to me carefully. If today you say, Ken, the truth is, if I were to die today, I'm not absolutely certain that I go to heaven. I know what that's like. I was there. I grew up in church. I attended church like you attend church. And at 26 years of age, I finally came to the place to where I realized and I knew I was headed for hell. And that was unacceptable to me. And so today, if you have never asked Jesus to come into your life and to forgive you of your sin, I beg of you, do it today. I have, folks, I have conducted funerals of people during the same week that they heard me preach on Sunday. None of us know if we're ever going to be alive. I do know this, that every time a person says no, not now, there is a veneer of resistance that comes over them. And it gets easier and easier and easier. Just like King Agrippa said to the Apostle Paul, almost you persuaded me to be a Christian. Almost. 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 Today, here's what I want to do. In just a moment... I want to lead you in a very simple prayer. If you've never asked Jesus to come into your life, I'm going to pray out loud where you can hear. You pray just between God and you. But now listen, you've got to be serious. You've got to be sincere. And if you will, you're going to walk out of here today on your way to heaven because my Bible tells me, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not might be, not maybe, shall be saved. Every head bowed, please. Every eye closed. Let me pray out loud. You pray just between God and you. Dear God, I admit I'm a sinner and I know I need a Savior. Thank you, God, for loving me and for sending Jesus to die for me. And this very moment, I open my heart to your son, Jesus Christ. Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. I receive you this very moment as my Savior and as my Lord. I am trusting you, Jesus. No one else, nothing else, simply you, Jesus, for the forgiveness of my sin. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, God, for sending Jesus to die for me. Thank you for bringing me into your forever family. While our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, please, no one looking. If just then you prayed, no one's looking but me. If just then you prayed and you meant it, will you do me a favor? In just a moment, just slip your hand up and take it down. And by doing, you're saying, Ken, I prayed, I meant it. I asked Jesus to be my savior. Would you slip it up? Just slip it up and take it down. God bless you, sir. Someone else, God bless you, sir. God bless you. While our heads are still bowed and eyes are closed. You walked in here today knowing that you're on your way to heaven. But you're going to walk out of here today. And how you walk out of here is dependent upon you. Don't walk out of here. If your life has basically been 
like that space between the first touch and the second touch of that blind man. You see, but not the way you ought to see. Then right now where you are seated, would you just absolutely surrender everything and say, Lord, touch me. Touch me again. Father, I want to thank you that you allowed me to grow up in a home with a father that had just an eighth grade education and he was no theologian, but he was a man whose life was transformed by the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that I had that example. Thank you, Lord, that I married a girl that was the real deal. And thank you, Lord, that you kept pursuing me even after I became your child. You knew that you weren't finished with me. And I pray, God, that we will be men and women at Northwest Bible who love you with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our might, that we will not be the typical 21st century Christian. We won't be puffed up. If anything, God, we will be so humbled by the fact that you saved us and you love us. And we will be vibrant believers. Your life will be on exhibit, magnified to others just like Paul wrote in Philippians chapter one. And so Lord, today, thank you for your love for us. And I thank you today for these that asked you to save them. And I thank you that they're gonna walk out of here today on their way to heaven. In Jesus' name, I pray and thank you. And everyone said, amen.